I spent uh, what essentially were the dark ages, about an eight-year period in administration at the University of Illinois, and I've, I've uh, refreshed my soul and returned back. I currently teach uh, intro crop sciences, and uh, years ago I taught intro soil science, so it's been really a, really a fun thing. So I'm out doing a little bit of training and, and working here and there and still, still teaching at the U of I. So Lisa kind of touched on this, uh, and I wonder if you could just, we could show uh, hands again. How, let's start with the purest motivation for somebody coming here. How many of you are here strictly for intellectual growth and, and spiritual growth uh, by listening to this talk? Okay, got six or seven fibbers out there. All right. Uh, show of hands again on CEUs. How many are here to harvest CEUs without regard to any of the material? Okay, a few of those. All right. <laughs> And then we have the, some of the unwashed that are here hoping for a miracle so they can pass the exam. Show of hands on that again. All right, very good. I think, and I'm not an AV guy, but I'm, is this too close or do I have to whisper? There you go. Okay. I don't have one of those um, NPR voices, but I can try to learn one real quick here to be real soft. What we're going to do is go through uh, some of the key objectives. So what could I potentially bring to this? You guys have, many of you are CCAs. A lot of this stuff you know intuitively. Other things you want to think about, uh, making changes or looking at increase in efficiency and so forth. So I think really, uh, if I can bring some value to this for you, it would be looking at this material and parsing out what I believe to be the most testable areas, the, mo the, the type of areas that bring together two concepts and have you think about things instead of just lists. And there's really been a, an effort on this new 4R thing to do just that. So we're gonna go through and uh, a lot of the performance objectives will appear in these slides. Uh, we'll go through this. Keep in mind the 4Rs, we're talking about the right source, the rate or amount, and the time and place. You know, when I first heard about the 4Rs, I was expecting, I'll be honest with you, I was expecting to see four different words that started with the letter R, and that's not the case, but there's other ways to try to remember this stuff. All of this comes about by trying to uh, put together programs that are going to increase nutrient stewardship, looking at these different parameters that are out there, taking all of these together, natural, social, human, physical, and financial capital, to try to optimize uh, agricultural production, particularly as it pertains to crops, and sort of an integrated type approach. So that's what, how this really came about. I was talking to a, a person who took the exam and didn't do so well, and uh, the four R's that they were talking about were reticence, regret, rage, and revenge. <laughs> By the way, that's meant to be humorous. If something here you find humorous, you can chuckle. It's absolutely fine to do that. Here's another way to look at the four R's. If you take rate out and put in A, you can remember key words like spat. Here's a couple. Uh, a married couple that's been married for some time, obviously they have their backs turned to each other. Some of you may have been in that situation. Uh, playing taps or the, the Pats, the New England Patriots. And what we're trying to do is to do the right thing here. So <clears throat> do we have anybody in the crowd that's over 40 years old? Anybody, a couple just squeaked by there, yeah. Um, you may remember the old Dudley Do-Right, the cartoon character. So what we're trying to do here is, is do the right thing, and I didn't think this crowd in particular was, was a huge fan of the Spike Lee movie. So. We went with Dudley Do-Right. So we're looking at this. Now, if you think about a two and a half to three hour uh, four R situation, um, how many of you were ecstatic thinking about that and thought this would perhaps be one of the most exciting things you'd gone through, at least in 2016? <laughs> close, yeah, close. It certainly merits consideration. About like a root canal. Uh, <clears throat> but what we're gonna do is try to bring you into this bathing light of truth I'm your shepherd walking through a valley, and this kind of picture yourself along this particular course. Mel, are you here? Mel, Mel Fiesel, there we go. Mel's here. He's my straight man. In fact, Mel felt so bad for me because I've, I've uh, outlined my lifestyle, unlike a wealthy landowner or retailer, I'm a, a downtrodden public servant trying to scratch my way to the middle class, and <laughs> Mel gave me a $5 bill. It's really true. He did this out here today. Mel, thank you very much. He said it was the first $5 he ever made. It was still in his wallet. He, <laughs> he opened it up and a bunch of moths flew out. But it's, 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 it's legal tender. We might give this away at the end of the talk. 
All right. So let's go over some vanilla topics to start with. So if you look at this exam, and we have, uh, we know people that have taken the exam and so forth, and given a general sense of what is out there. There are some topics that are more vanilla in that they're looking at the nuts and bolts of different uh, government entities, uh, how the planning process occurs, what is the CCA role in this. And there are a number of, uh, of materials out there that you can look at that will help you sort of answer many of these questions. So in, I'm gonna go through very quickly some of these first performance objectives and to send you off to, to look at those uh, on your own and then spend more of our time here directly on what I consider to be the real meat of the topic, which is specifically how do we pare down this enormous world of all the nutrients, all the different scenarios, situations, climate, soil, et cetera, to try to come up with some conceptual stuff that will allow us to focus on what it is to be better practitioners and perhaps to do better on the, uh, on the exam. Um, a lot of roles and responsibilities out there. Uh, a lot of these plans are created from the, the 590 stuff, so you go in there and look at ways to kind of build a plan that is going to take advantage of some of these different parameters. Again, accounting for all nutrients. Manure is going to be a big one, and, and we will make this point over and over again in my presentation. Anytime you have manure as a resource that has to be land applied, you always have to account for it. You have to apply it correctly. You have to account for it in the nutrient balance. So this is a very important take home that you, is gonna be sort of wound between all this different stuff that we look at. And again, when we're talking about uh, manure and, and also fertilizers, uh, phosphorus runoff, phosphorus can leach through the soil, but not as likely as nitrogen. And looking at how we're gonna manipulate nitrogen in its different forms to try to keep it from leaching. So identifying, this is a real key area, I would guess. I actually have a plant in here that has taken the exam, and I'm not going to make eye contact with this person right now, but I'm gonna, I do have peripheral vision where I can see them, and I'm going to ask this person, and I'm going to give the $5 is going to be handed over right now. I want to identify the person, but any kind of... Uh, Frantic nodding when I hit on a key point that might appear to the exam would be helpful for me as I go through this. Very good. There, thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, I can't disclose the name of this person. All right. So anyway, looking at setbacks for manure. This is a huge thing across the country. Maybe not as much in some of our areas here in the central U.S., but it's a huge issue in near lakes, Lake Erie, Chesapeake Bay, and that sort of thing, which has really come in and, and brought regulations into how this is handled. And then finally, you go to the land grant guidelines of what sort of application rates and so forth are gonna be made. And so what we're doing here is we're trying to integrate these four R's, uh, looking at the uh, nutrient uh, management plans, how do, how do you go through the certification process for that, looking at different cropping systems, farming situations, et cetera and looking at logistics, how do you move equipment around and so forth. We'll talk a lot about uh, nitrogen application, both rates and timing and placement as we go through this talk. And you know, people wonder, well, why is, why is this farmer using this practice, okay? Or why not this practice? And if you talk about the scale, the difference of scale and timing, that underlines some of the reasons that we do the current practices that we do have. So in other words, if you have a situation where you have loaded all of your nitrogen application into one particular time, and it rains, and you're on a silt loam soil, you've got a serious issue to deal with. So all of this stuff is, is integrated and parsed together. So we're gonna look at the different ways of uh, consequences of, of going off the chart. We'll talk about how uh, soil tests are interpreted and where you fit on a soil test for an individual element. We'll all be discussed and talk about the ramifications of being on either side of that. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take these uh, four R's and put them into a nutrient plan, talking about all these different things that are happening on the, on the field level. Soil tests are obviously a big part of any one of these types of approaches. We'll talk about the strengths and perhaps the, perhaps the weaknesses of some of these different soil tests and how you sort of manipulate or try to take advantage of different other things that you can look at in, in a field. So we're looking at record keeping, the responsibility of the CCA, who's, who may be involved in actually drawing up uh, nutrient management plans. 
Uh, another thing you'd be looking at is the total budget. So you want to make sure that you're, you're looking at uh, different types of application and what that's going to cost you, what it costs to ship in certain fertilizers, uh, if, the, if there's economic use of stabilizers or additives into your fertilizers, and what's the risk of timing changes. So let's say you have, your, your operation is, uh, you're a little short on equipment and you've got, uh, you know, 2,500 acres of corn and you decide, okay, I'm going to do 100%, uh, you know, maybe 30% pre-plant and then put the rest on at side dress and it rains, you've got an issue. So the logistics part of it is going to be a very important part of that as well. Okay, so that's an overview of sort of the stuff that goes with the plans and so forth. And now we're going to talk a little bit about... Uh, about the nutrients themselves and try to eliminate some of the worry that you have or concern of the broad landscape of all these different fertilizers and nutrients and key in on the stuff that's really going to be important, okay? I don't know, do any of you know this person uh, personally? Uh, Monocle Lewinster. This uh, gentleman's got, uh, he's got some, some people, some family around Goofy Ridge and a little bit in Chandlerville. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a topic that resonated. Um, and he is the manager of C. Hopkins Cafe. So he's a, he's a frugal individual, uh, harvests a lot of protein by hand out of the river. And uh, we'll understand here in a second why Monocle is so interesting to us. Here's C. Hopkins Cafe. Some of you have eaten at this particular location or something similar to it. They primarily feature in uh, over-percolated coffee and biscuits and gravy. Thank you. Not so much on the salad. But here's what you can pull out from this, and that is the list of the essential elements. You have to let your pronunciation go a little bit mush-mouthed on this, but if you'll roll with me here and think about this, C. Hopkins Cafe, managed by my cousin, Monocle, okay? And you can then parse out all of the individual elements. Now, nickel, for some of you who've been around for a while, nickel kind of comes in and out and is, is probably the last one that's added to that particular list. So we look at these and think about some of these major fertilizer elements. We've got the N, P, and K. Secondary fertilizer or lime, we've got sulfur, calcium, and magnesium. And then the rest, micronutrients. And there's some that are going to be very unusual for these to be deficient in uh, many of the fields that we deal with in this part of the world. So as you start taking out, you know, what, what are some things we can think about but we don't have to dwell on, and then look at the, what's left to focus on, this is really going to be the main gist of what we're talking about as we go through the four R's and we go through fertilizer management, manure, and liming, so all these different topics, okay? We can pretty much boil it down to, to what we see right here. Do we have iron deficiency in some cases? Sure, in higher pH soils. Does boron sometimes you know, add something to some of our crops? Yes, zinc, manganese to some extent. We'll talk a little bit about the micronutrients, where they might be an issue and, and where you might want to add them. But the main environmental issues that we're going to talk about with the four R's will be primarily with those fertilizers. Okay, so source. We may need to think in general about what, you know, what we're using, how this is going to affect different things. The right source is going to be determined by the crop and cropping system, the climate, the soil texture and pH, environmental concerns, and the crop stage, okay? And the way I'm going to go through this is I'll put out the, the, the four R's and then I will do examples and, and primarily with corn to start with here so we can go through these. Okay, cha-ching! The key points. So here are the key points. If you want to think broadly, especially about doing wellness exam or in general being better at what you do, here are the things you really want to be thinking about when you're talking about source. For instance, what are the plant available forms of each one of the nutrients that you're adding, okay? So if I tell you, uh, if, if I take that podium that's wood, that contains nitrogen, right? How do you think it would be as a nitrogen fertilizer? Not so good, right? Because it's not going to be available anytime, maybe even for years. So we're talking about sources and, and how those are going to be available in the soil. We'll also look at uh, potassium and phosphorus and talk a little bit about how the availability of those can be changed when we get into some soil conditions that tend to tie those up. 
and we may, may want to go to a banding. We'll interact with the placement and perhaps the timing to try to make those more available. So, match to the physical and chemical properties of the soil and the situation you're in. You know, folks growing rice in, in Arkansas are not going to use nitrate forms of nitrogen fertilizer because it's wet, it's saturated, and we're going to get denitrification, okay? Uh, and they also need to worry about if they've got slow flooding and we allow nitrification to happen and then flood it, we're going to lose the nitrogen that way as well. So we're not going to use any nitrate or hope not to have any nitrate form where we have saturation and warm conditions. No urea to high pH soils. The, we'll go over urea volatilization here after a while, but if you put urea on the soil surface and you have no-till that's limed and you've got a, a very thin band of high pH, that hydroxyl, the base part of that, is going to grab that urea and turn it back into CO2 and ammonia gas, and it'll be gone. Oh, very nice. Synergies. Yeah, let's go back to that. I got too excited with the head nodding. So, synergies. There are different uh, fertilizers that interact, both in a positive and negative way. So, phosphorus may be antagonistic or interfere with zinc uptake if we have an over-fertilized phosphorus field or we have you know, a lot of manure historically that's gone on that and have some so-called legacy phosphorus, that could be an issue. And in some cases, nitrogen, because of its general stimulation of plant growth, gives you more rooting and then you, phosphorus is big on root exploration and contact in the soil. So that may help us with uh, that kind of uptake. Choo -choo. Compatibility issues, size and hygroscopic factors. So when we're blending fertilizers, we need to think about you know, what the size of each of the pellets is so it doesn't sort of you know, go into its different particle sizes when it's thrown out over a spreader. Also, the accompanying ion makes a uh, difference in some really unusual cases. So for instance, tomato and tobacco are highly sensitive to chloride salt type stuff. So that may, you know, that may in some way influence your selection of what you'd want to use for potassium. Maybe go with a potassium sulfate instead of chloride because it has a lower salt index. And also, if you're, you're taking materials out, this is a kind of a, you know, extraneous point, but there can be some other contaminants or whatever in anything that we dig out of the soil, whether it be lime, phosphorus, or potassium that may come along with that. So with that, let's talk a little bit about nitrogen. Nitrogen is, is far and away the, uh, the most exciting element and uh, Dr. Bob Hafe is around here somewhere and you know this you can have a full career working primarily with nitrogen because and there's still people working on it there's not all is known so it's, it can change forms it's part of the environmental picture and it is really in big demand by uh, the grass crops whether it be you know corn wheat rye barley whatever so when we talk specifically of nitrogen source on corn Again, we're going back to these same parameters or same uh, metrics that we looked at before, and we're trying to see how this all uh, makes sense with that. Um, we think about the soil texture, the pH, the climate, uh, environmental concerns, and the crop stage. So let's, let's move to an audience participation part of the program here. So we have, it's, it's unusual to get this many intellectuals in one room at the same time. So there could be some, some synergies. Okay, if you were to just say, let's think about nitrogen, and you would think about, like, what are some things that you should know about nitrogen? Like, there's a practice, and if you're using such and such a practice, what, what should you be thinking about? You see where I'm going with this? So a lot of the stuff on the uh, exam and in real life involves scenario thinking, where you have to look at a situation, and some light has to go off in your head saying, uh-huh. That could be a problem. Let's say that you like to hunt deer with a bow and arrow. A few people murmur on that. No camel here today, but I guess that's done for the year. Um, and you decide that, you know, I'm gonna, I'd like to get anhydrous on early so I can concentrate on my hunting. How does that work out? Not so good, right? So that'd be one area. So looking at the play of applying anhydrous and how that interacts with climate, timing, and so forth. What about uh, your, you have an irrigated sandy field, how is that going to affect your nitrogen application? So you see where this is going. So you look at one situation, you're going to cut back on the amount you put at pre-plant, you're going to kind of 
you know, spoon feed it on. You might even use an irrigation system to get that done. So that's the way we need to start thinking about that. Uh, the type of tillage is going to be a, an issue too because of the interaction of some of the sources of, uh, of nitrogen that go on the surface that can evolve off as a gas if we're not careful. Water quality assessment tools and, and risk. We need to be thinking about this, you know, what, what are some ways that we can keep this nitrogen from getting into the groundwater or getting into the surface water through our tiled fields. So if it goes down to the tile and out, it's, it's basically going to get in the surface water that way. We'll talk a little bit about eutrophication. That is a problem with, uh, with both nitrogen and phosphorus where they stimulate uh, growth of algae. And what that algae does is, is uh, takes, you know, just changes the general nature of that particular water, water body, and that's a bad issue. Uh, I'm old enough that I remember uh, the old SCS talking about fertilizing farm ponds to increase the, the weight of gain of bluegills, and so we don't have to worry about that. That practice is no longer really out there. Okay, so let's talk about the major nitrogen fertilizer forms, and what are the, some of the things we need to be thinking about, as well as some of the things that, opportunities that we might have uh, with these particular carriers. Calculations, folks, there are going to be calculations on exams, right? And from what I gather, you don't have to remember factors per se, but you need to know how to do math, okay? You need to know how to cancel units and we go through this. And we'll talk about some very simple uh, calculations here and then on this webinar that I'm going to do, I will, I will spend one of the webinars doing almost exclusively calculations of that particular kind. So we take a look here. All right, take a look at the, uh, this is the, uh, it's only a year or two old, uh, National Survey of Corn Producers and the type of end carrier they use. And uh, you've got ammonia and UAN solutions, combination, urea, et cetera, okay? What do you think the number one carrier is worldwide of nitrogen fertilizer use? Urea, right? And why is that? So let's say you're not sitting on flat black ground in the middle of Illinois, but you're, uh, you're working on terrace ground in Nepal or something, it's very difficult to get the anhydrous tank up there, right? You can see that. So yeah, the point is you put urea in a bag and it's easy to handle, you can take care of it that way. Ammonium nitrate's sort of fallen out of favor here recently. Okay, so anhydrous, um, and this process, as many of you know, this is the Haber-Bosch process. It's only been with us for just really not quite 100 years yet. And we're taking atmospheric nitrogen gas with natural gas and under high heat and pressure forming this particular anhydrous ammonia. The 82 means, of course, that it's 82% nitrogen. Okay, first math little deal here for you to think about. If this particular compound is 82% nitrogen, and you want 100 pounds of nitrogen, do you use more or less than 100 pounds of anhydrous? More, right? Because not all of it is nitrogen. So we need to start thinking about flipping these fractions and how we actually make these calculations because that is something you're gonna to have to do on this particular exam. Um, extensive use in the Midwest and we'll look at, uh, I've got some price scenarios and uh, I'm always trying to update these, that it changes fairly rapidly. We'll look at that a little bit later. Urea, 46%. Okay, and that's the formula. And uh, do we have anybody uh, in the room today with a PhD in chemistry? Good. I always check for that before I start making up stories about chemistry. I don't want to get cross-checked right up here. Like, uh, by the way, I don't know if you knew this, but uh, I'm the <laughs> department head of chemistry at Stanford. Oh. <laughs> Thanks for, thanks for dropping by. Okay. But if you look at this, you can see you start adding up the different uh, molecules there to basically we're looking at carbon dioxide and ammonia gas that are put together. And this is soluble. It may volatilize from the surface. And we'll talk about the urease enzyme and how that works on the application of this material. Here's the ESN. I was talking to the ESN guy. Uh, this is a urea that's put into a capsule. You see the now, here's a question, uh, this one is on the exam. Why is this urea 44% nitrogen and the regular urea is 46? Must, must be the weight of the polymer, right? So that just dilutes it some. So you've got this uh, a granule around there that, that it's, uh, 
We, we've done this with herbicides and other things, try, sort of an encapsulation to try to slow down uh, the movement of that out of, out, of the, uh, out of the capsule. And it costs a little bit more to put the, the nitrogen in that form. Sulfur-coated urea used more probably for turf, but here's another way, a physical barrier, the sulfur has to dissolve. So you would hope that that would take water, and if there's enough water to dissolve the, the sulfur, it would be enough to get the urea uh, put into the ammonium form uh, in the soil. Ammonium nitrate, uh, here you've got ammonia gas and nitric acid, and, uh, but it's explosive, and this is a, this is a big issue, obviously. Uh, is there anyone here, I always ask this question everywhere I go, there's a gathering of people, because these folks are, you know, <laughs> not, not always in high percentage in the crowd. Is there anybody here that's blown up a stump with ammonium nitrate? <laughs> See, I've only got about two takers in the last couple of years. I used to ask, is there anybody here that fought in the Civil War. And you know what? It started to taper off the last few years. All right. Or as they would say in North Carolina State, the, uh, the War of Northern Aggression. That's a whole other story. Okay, so, and then we've got the UAN solutions with, uh, contain both urea and ammonium nitrate, and they have a, a variable uh, rate there, or content of 28 to 32 percent. But anytime we're using UAN solutions, and I know for a fact this was a question on the, the old CCA exam years ago, anytime we've got a UAN solution, we have to think this is half ammonium nitrate, half urea. So you could figure out from that how much uh, potential volatilization you might be dealing with. Ammonium sulfate uh, can be used on flooded rice because if we put the ammonium ion into a situation where there is no oxygen, the anaerobic or facultative bacteria will not work on the ammonium for denitrification because it has to go into the nitrate form first, okay? So that conversion is not made. So it's also used with, for, with herbicides to put stuff into the, um, into the plant. There are other nitrogen carriers, and there's a few other ones as well, uh, besides the ones I have listed here, but uh, the diammonium phosphate and, and monoammonium phos phosphate are carriers that contain both phosphorus and nitrogen. So, I will tell you in soils class that I've taught, in crops class, on the CCA exam, if you're using DAP or MAP as your phosphorus carrier, you need to find out how much of that fertilizer you need to meet the phosphorus need, and then you have to account for the amount of nitrogen that you have, okay? So for instance, let's say, we'll cut to the chase in this calculation, we figure out that we're gonna use uh, 100 pounds of DAP. We're gonna use 100 pounds of DAP for something. We're meeting some phosphorus need. How many pounds of nitrogen does that bring with it? 18, right? You multiply 100 by 18%. So all throughout the kind of calculations you might do with fertilizers, you've gotta take all of the parts of the carrier into account. Okay, this is, uh, I was giving talks a couple years ago, I, it's either 14 or 15, I can't remember exactly when I got this data, but the main thing I wanted to show here was the relative price positioning of the different carriers of nitrogen. And because all of the, uh, the different nitrogen sources start with anhydrous, anhydrous is the building block and it is the least expensive on a unit basis, uh, and so look here at this particular time, 51 cents for a pound of nitrogen, all the way up the ammonium sulfate, some people said it's way too high. Maybe that was the spot market I looked at at the time. And I know that there's more economical carriers of ammonium sulfate in liquid for those of you that are nearby areas where the transportation of that liquid makes sense and you want some additional sulfur to go with that. How are the prices today compared to this? So I just grabbed these a uh, couple weeks ago. Uh, and you know, again, there's, there's some variation of these. But the point I want to make is that the relative positioning of the prices remains fairly constant in that UAN solutions are gonna be a little higher than urea, they're all gonna be more expensive than anhydrous, you start putting capsules in or something, you're gonna continue those prices up. Okay, so let's start talking about dealing with some of these different carriers and what the main things we wanna be thinking about. So for anhydrous ammonia, if you have a test and people wanna ask about anhydrous, what I would do is, number one, I'd be interested to know if you understood 
what the reaction is of anhydrous that goes into a moist soil. Like how, how does this turn into something that the plant can use? I might also want to know that you're familiar with the concept of this fact that if you put this material in or it somehow the conditions change and you're in a warm moist condition that that's going to go and, and go on to nitrate. And then how do you potentially stop that? So these are the different things that would be uh, of interest. Also, soil conditions for applying anhydrous. So if you have a, a tilth that's good where you're going to get closing over where that knife goes, that's going to be important. Some of you may have seen or experienced dry, cloudy soils uh, turning. You can see little puffs of white ammonia coming up out of the soil because the conditions were not uh, perfect for, for holding that in there. So what happens is this. The ammonia grabs a water molecule and forms ammonium hydroxide, okay? Ammonium hydroxide. So the NH4 has a plus charge. The OH has a negative charge. That ionizes or breaks apart and then you have the ammonium sticking to the soil. So this is, this is the starting point we have for ammonia. We know that ammonium ion over time is going to create acidity in the soil, but at the very first, it's interesting, right around that knife point, the pH is actually elevated because of all of that hydroxyl that gets turned loose. So what happens there on, on a very small scale is different than the large scale where over time, we're gonna to need to actually add agricultural lime to counteract that. So here's a, another scenario, and this is out of the uh, manual. I'm gonna hold this up because I've also received uh, testimony from some of the test takers that this is a valuable uh, asset here for people taking the exam. I, I'm not marketing these, I don't have a commission, but this IPNI 4R plant nutrition uh, manual, which can be purchased online, uh, I found helpful in going through and looking at some of these different scenarios. So they, this, is a, this is a publication that's been put out and I grabbed this directly from that uh, particular manual. I found this slide online. And what this does, and this is a classic of looking at a graph and having to interpret for yourself what in the world has happened here, okay? So if you take a look at this, you've got the blue line has got a soil a potassium level of 139 part per million, and then the lower line has a soil K of 80 part per million. So you've got basically too low a K and then sufficient K, and you would wanna be looking at this particular thing and making a decision, an interpretation for yourself of what in the world is going on. And it looks like, if we take a look here, interpret the graph, if you've got a low potassium where that plant's gonna be restricted, the, it's gonna be the most limiting element because it's not there in enough quantity. And if you look at that, you say, look, if the plant's healthier, it's got more, pota the potassium deficiency's been taken care of, now we're gonna get that response to nitrogen that we're looking for, okay? So this is the kind of thing you may have to think through when you look at these particular exams. Here's another scenario, and this is uh, my buddy over at uh, Purdue that I went to grad school with. Uh, Jim the Bull Camberato, um, looking at a wide variety of data from Indiana, looking at the response of N rates as a function of corn and nitrogen prices and trying to find the sweet spot. And in that, this particular case, there's not that much variation. Also, uh, we'll talk about some of the other sort of uh, ways that we take a look at assessing the amount of nitrogen we want to put on from uh, maximum return to nitrogen, which a number of us use here. There's some other new programs and so forth that are coming out for people to try to assess what their nitrogen situation is in the field. Okay, so moved on, and that was a cha-ching when I go to the rate key points. What do we want to be thinking about when we think about rate? So we want to make sure we assess the plant demand. We want to make sure we're armed with some sort of analyses that we can look at whether it be soil and plant tissue tests or response experiments where we've, we have a sense of, of whether we're gonna get a, re a positive reaction, a positive improvement on yield based on an application of a certain fertilizer. And I would certainly add into this, looking at visual symptoms of nutrient deficiencies is gonna be a very important part of that. Also, we should be aware that there are some field conditions that are going to be susceptible to a particular nutrient deficiency, okay? So you look at the broad range of information that you do have. 
If you have a blow sand, so-called, down around Havana, Illinois, that's got less than a half percent organic matter and virtually no clay, and you look at the pH, you could have some micronutrient and secondary element deficiencies that could show up there where you may not be as likely to see them in a flat black soil, okay? So assess all the different sources of material that you have, uh, manure, biosolids, even irrigation water. In Nebraska, uh, folks have planned ahead a little bit, they've stored some nitrogen in the groundwater. So when they, when they come and irrigate that, they actually have to take credit for that particular nitrogen that's there. And there's some naturally high uh, you know, waters that we can pump as well. Also think about the crop residues and the interaction of what those bring to the uh, nutrient story and what they take away through immobilization. Cha-ching. More key points. Project fertilizer use efficiency, okay? Look at the soil reserve impact. So sometimes, I know uh, Emerson's talked about this and looked at this research-wise a number of times. If you have a, uh, if you're doing consecutive corn, corn on corn, and you have a, a drought year, you know, try to take account of how much nitrogen might be left in that soil profile, depending what happens during the winter, and you might be able to, to get some uh, benefit from that. Uh, Rate-specific economies, remember we're always looking at trying to get this economically viable where that last unit of fertilizer gives you at least the economic response in grain and we don't go the other way. So a lot of these curves flatten out on the top. So how do we just establish a nitrogen rate? You know, years ago, uh, most, most universities, most land grants had a pounds or pound per expected bushel. And we also would take credit for uh, soybean, you know, before that. And that probably in some cases did an okay job, but things are moving on. There's some different things that people are looking at now. Rate calculation, economics, weather, crop type, and stage. So there are a number of different ways. The maximum return to nitrogen is used in how many states, Howard? There's at least three, four, five that are on there. Seven, okay. Um, we're looking at the relationship of crop price, the relationship of nitrogen price, and looking at where that economic sweet spot is. And oftentimes the economic yield is going to be a little bit to the left of the overall yield, but we're, we're trying to get the, uh, the main bang for the buck in that. So there are a lot of different models and tests out there that, you know, I don't have the Illinois uh, soil nitrogen test on here, that's one of them. Pre-plant tests, pre-side dress, uh, corn N and Circa, Adapt N, this is the one out of Cornell that, uh, so yeah, I've got uh, grad school buddies all over the world it seems like, but this guy was my office mate, like Harold Van S from Cornell, don't know much about the program. And there's more on the way. There are a lot of people working now to try to model and estimate the amount of nitrogen that's in the soil. Now what's the problem here? The problem is, for the part of the world that we're in, in a humid region, where we've got hopefully adequate rainfall, sometimes way too much, the nitrogen story can change so rapidly that we don't know, you know how much of the nitrogen today is gonna to be available tomorrow. The further west we move and the drier, and we're controlling the water that goes on, we have more of a chance to sample the soil and see, see what's going on there. Soil characteristics, topography, runoff, crop type, and stage. We'll take a look with, uh, with corn and nitrogen a little bit on when the accumulation occurs and what, you know, when do we least want a nitrogen deficiency, and I'll have more thoughts on that as we get there. So, for a nitrogen rate, you're gonna calculate the nitrogen credits that might be out there, previous and applications, sometimes important, uh, and it's, it's debatable on the, uh, on the diammonium phosphate or monoammonium phosphate, how much that nitrogen is there, uh, but for the purpose of this test, you may wanna consider that to be there. The soil organic matter, manure, biosolids, all of these potential sources of nitrogen that are coming in here. There's a uh, uh, ag chem group, and I know some of the folks that work with there that do some experiments near Champaign, Illinois. And uh, 2014 was a pretty good year, right? What do you think, this is mind boggling, and I believe this data because it was replicated, a zero addition nitrogen plot on a drummer soil with in excess of 5% organic matter after soybean. 
Let's blurt out some numbers. What do you think? And I'm going to tell you, nearly perfect rainfall. If you could have ordered rainfall, I don't know what you would have changed the way it came. Anybody want to guess on what the yield was with zero bushel or zero pounds of nitrogen? 200. 200. Did you, were you at that plot too? Okay. <laughs> well, actually, you're incorrect. It was 196. <laughs> No, but this is sensational. So you start thinking about this. How in the world can this happen? Well, you've got organic matter that goes way beyond the acre furrow slice in that soil. And my thoughts are the moisture and temperature coming in there, that stuff was just pumping out mineralized and nitrified nitrogen uh, over the course of that year. That's obviously unusual. But we can break, we do get a contribution from soil that is, is not perfectly quantified. Other techno technology we can use. I know a lot of the folks that raise uh, winter wheat uh, in the, the Kansas area in particular, uh, they sometimes run stalker calves out on this wheat and they use a lot of uh, sensors to look at greenness based on an over-fertilized plot and then one that you know, requires more nitrogen. You can also do a post-season stock uh, nitrate test or do plant analyses during the season. Uh, have any of you ever heard talks by some of the high yield folks that are, that are around the countryside? Any show of hands? Anybody heard? Yeah. So it's interesting, and I had, had an opportunity to talk to one of these individuals, and uh, in this particular case, he was taking almost weekly tissue tests and looking for a threshold that's far in excess of what we would normally you know, say. So it's really curious. Just trying to track the, the, uh, how that plant's doing and when there might be entry points for nitrogen uh, along the way. All right, timing key points. How many people are having just a blast right now? This is a very quiet crowd. Just, it's very riveting, I understand that. Any sleepers back there at all? Tap one. I'm gonna, I'll tell you a short story here for the good of the cause. So I'm lecturing in, in uh, Turner Hall at the University of Illinois, and the one room holds 100 people. The, even though the University of Illinois is an engineering school, they do not offer uh, HVAC coursework, apparently. Because we, <laughs> there's, there's two temperatures that, uh, that exist throughout the year in those classrooms, um, 75 and 95. And the 95, they run most of the year. So, if it's not a riveting topic and you put someone, you give them a lot of protein and you sit them down, make them still and heat it to 95, it's not, you know, it can lead to some possible snoozing. So I really have stumbled upon this technique that I'm gonna share with you now that is absolutely unbelievable. It has not failed ever, I'm, not, I'm, I'm dead serious. So let's say that I see someone starting to drop off, you know, and you get, first you get the eyes widened where they, they think you don't, see that their entire face is distended to try to keep their eyes open. <laughs> and you, then you start, to, you start to get a couple snappers going, a couple head snaps, and then uh, usually a strand of drool, okay? So they go over <laughs> sideways. So I know they're, they're going down, I mean, it's, it's ready. So this is the thing I stumbled onto. Instead of making loud noises, uh, I will show you precisely what I do. Let's say that someone here is sleeping, and I'll be t I'm talking along like this. It's like the hum of the tires, you know? If you, Fall asleep at the wheel, you're like, all of a sudden you can't hear anything. So uh, we'll be talking along like. And I've never had anybody keep their head down through the eight count. So it's really interesting. <laughs> I, had, I had one go about six and a half, this thing, but well, this girl was like slobbered, you know, like a horse coming in. Boom! <laughs> Came up and soaked down the first row of students and. And she just felt so good. She said, I am so sorry. I stayed up all night working on a paper. I just started talking again. <laughs> anyway, so <I> try. <laughs> yeah, back when cell phones first came out, before the texting and everything like that, as you know, a few people had them. And, and I thought, you know, that's fine. Everybody needs to be in communication. I said, if you are in some way connected directly with the White House and they need your input on a, launching a nuclear strike somewhere or something, that's fine. Otherwise, um, if it rings once and you shut it off, you're good. If it rings a second time, I'm, I'm going to answer it. So I said, just put it up in the air and just let it keep ringing. So I'd get the phone. I'd go, hello, Tom? 
no, this is Tom's professor. And then I'd make up some embarrassing story and then hand his phone back. So that, that quieted that down pretty much. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about uh, key points uh, with timing. So timing. And this is a huge one for corn, obviously, with nitrogen. That's one we'll spend quite a bit of time on. We need to look at the dynamics of nutrient supply. And I know you, you've, some of you are, are playing with cover crops, and uh, we've got a cover crop legend uh, in, in with us here today. But a lot of the thing about moving nitrogen into our system is the synchronizing the nitrogen, whether it be from fertilizer, cover crop, last year's residue, synchronizing the release of the usable nitrogen when that plant is taking it up in the largest amounts, okay? So we're gonna talk a little bit about mineralization and mobilization, also about leaching, and then also about logistics. And you know, I'll, fat, I'll flash forward here a little bit, we're gonna talk about how would you raise a single corn plant given a resource of nitrogen versus 2,500 acres. And you might not take the same approach both ways. Something we'll, we'll think about and talk about here later. Okay, so nitrogen timing. Uh, soil nitrogen test levels, if you're using those for some reason. Uh, the different environmental risks. So working with irrigated producers in, in, I don't know, Illinois at the time when I was doing a lot of stuff with irrigation only had uh, oh, about half a million or a little less acres of, of irrigated corn, but a lot of it is on sandy soils and therefore the risk of leaching was the most important because if you take two inches of rain and put it on a dry silt loam, it will soak in distance X. If you put that same two inches on sand, it'll probably be three X where that'll go. So it's gonna take any nitrate, nitrogen that's there will be taken down. We'll look at leaching here in a little bit. Okay, nitrogen timing, a big one, and I'm sure they're gonna hit this uh, I uh, wouldn't be surprised to see them hit this on the exam. Application uh, on saturated, frozen, or snow-covered soils is a no-no uh, because in all these cases, whether it be phosphorus, manure, nitrogen, the chances of it being whisked away, particularly if there's any kind of slope at all, are quite large. And we'll look at split application opportunities. How many, uh, just a quick show of hands, how many of you are doing more um, more application entry points than you were 10 years ago. Anybody move to more? Yeah, so d doing that kind of thing. So that, that makes sense. Um, the use and timing and impact of urease inhibitors, nitrification inhibitors, we'll talk about both those and what they do, controlled release products and slow release nitrogen products. So all of these things are gonna be sort of wound in with the nitrogen timing. Cover crops, and there's a lot of stuff going on here. You know, the, uh, the term research, if you really break that down, it, it's, two, it's got two syllables, re and search. So it's a look again at stuff that's going. And I'm, I've almost made it through a full cycle. When I was here in 1990 through 92, I did a lot of cover crop research over at the U of I, looking at times to kill rye and hairy vetch and so forth. But there's some interesting things that are going on there, and the nitrogen cycling within those systems is certainly something that's also quite interesting. So you take a look at when that nitrogen can be released, when it's gonna be taken up by the cover crop, how does that all interact with our corn or follow crop? We've seen this and a number of people have made these uh, sorts of uh, graphs before, looking at how nitrogen uptake occurs uh, during the season. And uh, in this particular example, we're looking at the first 10% of nitrogen is taken up between planting and V6. So you're, you're talking about you know, not a lot of that nitrogen being taken up into the plant at that time, but it's very critical. I saw a lot of, uh, a lot of yellow corn this year. There are some people that uh, either got rained out of a pre-plant, didn't have any nitrogen down at all, had some immobilization. And I would submit to you that even though that corn is small, V6, if you've got a nutrient deficiency at that time, you can already have your yield starting to go down. The different components are being set for that yield to continue. About 60% is taken up during that rapid period. And this is when you're out in the field and you, you look and it seems like the corn's sitting there, sitting there, all of a sudden it takes off and really starts uh, heading skyward. And we can take up uh, you know, six to eight pounds of nitrogen per day per acre in these kind of scenarios. So obviously you want the nitrogen there. You're all well aware of this, uh, but 
once we get into the, the reproductive time and we start developing, we fertilize ovules, we've got something there to receive the goodies that are coming in through photosynthesis, we start moving nitrogen out of all the parts of the corn and into the grain, okay? And eventually we, uh, we get that, you know, quite a bit of it into the grain itself. And I think this is true, I've read it enough different places, today's corn hybrids seem to be better at utilizing nitrogen later in the season than they were many years ago. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, someone, but I think that we've allowed for nitrogen applications to be a little bit later and still hope that that can get in and do some good into the corn. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about some things you can add, some things that are, uh, that are going to help us and create efficiency uh, and, and reduce losses of nitrogen away from the corn. Uh, urease inhibitors are an important tool and uh, of course these are uh, these have been around for, for quite some time. There's a, there's a couple things out there now, but the NBPT's been around for a number of years. NPPT is used in some cases. I know that uh, uh, BSF's got a new urease inhibitor that has both of those. The Agrotan, I think, has the single one. There's some other stuff coming, I think, in the pipeline. But the general, the general deal that all these things are doing or hoping to do is to try to break down the, or reduce the amount of loss that we have from urea volatilizing into the atmosphere. And this urease enzyme is everywhere. So there's a lot of uh, urea in proteins and different amino acids, all the nitrogen, nitrogenous compounds where things are breaking down. So there's a lot of it in turf, there's a lot of it in corn residue, it's, it's pretty much everywhere. So the more residue you have, the more, and surface applied is, is going to be more of a, uh, an opportunity to use these urease inhibitors. And here's kind of what they do. It's interesting, it's a physical blocking. So we've identified that some people are older than 40 and may remember Pac-Man, you know, this little game? And maybe some of you are still working on Pac-Man on your compact computer with a five and a quarter inch floppy. That's an age related, yeah, you know, something people are like, what's he talking about? Okay. Um, but the point is here, this, this, this urease enzyme inhibitor is basically a plug, like don't they have this in trumpets, like a mute or something you stuff in there? I like, uh, well let me ask, has anyone here ever eaten a chicken wing? You know, three or four people, yeah, you, is anybody at the back two thirds, you're still with me here, right? <laughs> Let's say you're with a, uh, you're sitting next to a friend who likes chicken wings as well or better than you do and you have a plate of them there and these chicken wings are disappearing at a rate that's too rapid as you talk, right? You could roll up a sock and stop the ingestion of chicken wings temporarily while you told your story. That's kind of what this urease enzyme inhibitor does. It plugs up that spot while other stuff's going on. So it can buy you some time in waiting for rainfall or incorporation to put that into the soil. And there's a lot of different figures out there in research that show, yeah, that loss can be quite great. What's the worst possible scenario for urea volatilizing into the atmosphere? There'd be several conditions. You want residue or no residue? Residue. How about moisture? Moist but not wet, right? So a heavy dew, a light rain that solubilizes the urea but doesn't put it into the soil. If we get an inch of rain, It'll dissolve the urea, put it in the soil, and it'll be fixed as ammonium and will be all right. So here, th those are the areas where that is going to be an important practice. It has been used in, uh, particularly in no-till corn production for a number of years. Okay, one distinction, we'll talk about nitrification inhibitors here shortly, that a urease enzyme inhibitor, okay, as the name implies, uh, is going to inhibit the urease enzyme so it's gonna slow volatilization. Nitrification inhibitors work on beating down the nitrosomonas bacteria that make the transformation of ammonium to nitrate to nitrate, which we'll go over here in a little bit. So there's no dual purpose of these specific types of materials. Okay, here's a little thing that I put before students. This is another way to grab uh, attention of folks that are drifting off. If you have college students and show them whiskey barrels, they get excited. Why? Because they like putting plants in them, right? Okay. So if I give you a, a barrel like this full of nice soil, and I give you a one corn seed which is guaranteed 
to germinate, emerge, and be a great plant, and then I give you a set amount of nitrogen, I'd like you to think about when would you be, how would you allocate the nitrogen to that growing plant, okay? So think about this, you've got plenty of time on your hands, you're just sitting there like this uh, dude, Von Liebig, who measured, a, who weighed a, a pot every day for five years or something. Um, so you're, you know, you're down, you're, you're let's, let's make it more poetic. Let's say you're a person living by yourself in a log cabin and you're scratching a dog on the head every night and eating a little food and that's your life. That's, that's the maximum of your social life, okay? Everybody got that? So you've got plenty of time to think about putting nitrogen on corn. When would you put the nitrogen into the barrel to, for the corn? How many would put it all out in the fall before and go fishing? That's one option. How about, how about you put a little bit out in the beginning, a lot out in the beginning, how would you do it? You would probably match the uptake patterns of that corn. So functionally, it's difficult to do because of the fact that we have lots of acres, we have weather to deal with, lots of different things happen. But precisely, you would feed that corn when it was hungry and have it there. We have a lot of entry points now to get into corn. We got fall, we got pre-plant, side dress, we now have some high clearance uh, opportunities to go in that the people have been working on. Um, we have, uh, you know, getting a bad pinch, you got aerial. There's a fair amount of, well, more than normal urea flown onto some fields that got drained out. And you have also uh, an opportunity with irrigation if that's, if that's uh, the kind of setup that you do have. So a lot of different entry points to think about in increasing the efficiency of nitrogen. And a lot of ways we can put urea on including flying it on. So a lot of those different things happen. When we think about nitrogen behavior, there's a lot of stuff out there that's going to be changing and change the form of that particular nitrogen. There are only two forms of nitrogen that can be taken up by plants. Nitrate, which has a negative charge, and ammonium, which has a positive charge. Which of those is the safest in terms of being in the soil and being accountable? Kind of like, I like to think of a, you know, Scoutmaster or something. I mean, just a salt, like a, can I use your name? No, okay. <laughs> kind, of like, kind, of, kind of like a guy like Dick. You know, totally dependable, there anytime you need him, not a problem. That's ammonium. How about nitrate? That's a little bit more like Johnny Depp. Or who's the other guy that's in and out of rehab? But, you know, you don't, nitrate's a little bit wild. Nitrate can, can transform into forms that are no longer usable. Now, if you've got a plant there growing rapidly and you've got nitrogen, it's beautiful. Comes right in with mass flow, not a problem at all. So many fertilizer forms, and, and here's, the, here's the famous nitrogen cycle. We'll talk, we've talked a little bit about some of this stuff uh, in passing, but there are a number of losses or tie-ups or transformations that are going to be important, and we need to think about the environmental conditions and the sources and carriers that are gonna trigger each of these. Our goal, of course, is to get the maximum amount of nitrogen into the plant, get good yield, and, and keep it all basically in the soil. The problem is that all forms eventually go to nitrate. That is the way of the world as this stuff moves in warm, humid conditions. So if we have nice conditions for plant growth, we're gonna have conditions where it's gonna favor uh, nitrate over ammonium. Here's the process we start with with organic matter, the turnover. So wouldn't it have been awesome to come to, to Illinois and you got this guy, John Deere, who had an idea and you roll the soil over and you plant and you're like, oh, this is unbelievable. Especially if you've been run out of, uh, you know, Eastern Pennsylvania or upstate New York when you're, you have rocks and it's like, this is, un this is unreal. So the bright people that were going west stopped here. Some of them went on and got, uh, had some issues in the Donner Pass and wish they'd come back. But anyway, this was, yeah, this is the sweet spot. So when you're thinking about what a great life you have, you might want to think back to your ancestors who got tired or had arthritis and couldn't walk anymore and stopped in Illinois or Iowa. That's a, that's a big, big secret to success. Okay, so we're talking originally about this organic matter turnover. I do need to tell one story from the South Farm on campus. There were a couple of small fields, long rectangles, that were combined, and so I don't know how many years they were that way, I, don't, I mean, decades. 
soil was like a, people driving over, it's probably compacted, whatever, but just kind of hanging out. And the next year you could see to the inch where that fallow system was, where the corn was so much greener and taller. It's very interesting. So you get some of that effect here of, of the mineralization happening and just the overall soil tilth and so forth. So organic matter breakdown, we're, we're talking you know, worms, beetles, animals, reduce the size, bacteria and fungi do the final step and they're releasing ammonium from that organic matter. Now they're, uh, like us, uh, they need carbon, reduced carbon sources. So this is like a glazed donut or something for these bacteria. They get some residue and they break it down and they, they put it off into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. That's how they get their energy. And this is a classic figure that's been bandied around for a number of years. I don't know if this is right or not. I mean, some of these high yields on zero nitrogen make me wonder if we're fully accounting for some of the mineralization that does happen. But if we get mineralization, we got ammonium going in the plant, we're in, we're in good shape. The next process is nitrification. And this one is going to occur on the heels of mineralization. Bob, are you still here? I'm going to channel, I'm going to channel him. I'm going to tell you that in the, in the best part of the growth season, where you've got nice rainfall, but not saturation, warm temperatures, that ammonium is going to be transferred into nitrate fairly quickly. So you're, up, you're going to have nitrate happening quite a bit, okay? This is a two-step process here. The first one is done by nitrosomonas bacteria, the second one by nitrobacter. And we don't really consider nitrite in soils. That's the one in the middle. So I'm going to go over this. I'll, I'll go over this as many times as necessary, but I'm going to give you an audio representation of the speed of these two reactions. And then I'm going to ask you as a group to tell me which one of these you think is faster. Everybody on board with that? Everybody ready to go? And you can, you can have conversations, you can call out, whatever you want to do. You can get on the phone and ask somebody. But we're going to go through this, you know, go, we'll do it once and see if anybody gets it and then we'll do it again if necessary. Okay. We go over that again, or everybody set. <laughs> I was in Georgia a couple weeks ago, did that four times. <laughs> All right. So, the rate limiting factor is the first one. So, if we want to slow down nitrification, we would work on that first reaction. We'll look at that with nitrification inhibitors here shortly. So this is a big thing in row crop agriculture in this part of the world, is the balance between immobilization and nitrification, okay? So if we have a high carbon load, a lot of carbon, crop residue, wheat residue, corn stover, and we put that into the soil, we come back with a grass crop that wants nitrogen, we're going to have a problem, okay? The microbes always win the battle. Here's what's happening. You are putting all kinds of food into the soil, and when the conditions are warm and moist, those bacteria are saying, hey, here's a feast, we're going to increase our family size. They need nitrogen in, a, in an exact ratio with the amount of carbon they're eating to build up this bacterial mass. So what happens is they pull all the available nitrogen out of the soil and into their bodies. When they run out of food and start dying, then you, you run into a situation where that nitrogen is now being released back into the nitrogen pool. So these are important uh, processes that are happening and how these balance out is going to go a long way to telling us the nutrition for our grass crops. You've probably seen a lot of this before, the, the influence of the carbon-nitrogen ratio. Corn and wheat, very high. Soybean, not so high, and alfalfa lower. Basically, if we have anything above about 20 to 30 to 1, we are going to incur immobilization. So what's the worst possible scenario that would lead to nitrogen deficiency in young corn? If you could design a scenario in your mind, what would be the absolute worst situation, the worst possible practice where you would be tying up nitrogen away from that corn seedling? How about the year before? Big, big corn, we're going corn on corn, okay? That's number one. Would it be big yield or, or small yield? Big, right? So we got lots of residue. You're going to leave it on top or, or till it in right after harvest? I'd let it lay there. Let it lay there, turns cold, late harvest. 
You got all kinds of residue to deal with. You come out in the spring, it's a mess. You go, man, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut this up. I don't know, going through with a chopper, vertical disc, whatever, then turn it into the soil and plant. Now you've laid all that carbon right in next to that corn, and you are going to have to deal with paying that nitrogen penalty. That's the worst possible situation. Turn alfalfa in, and you've got nitrogen releasing immediately. Big difference. So mobilization, you've got to think about the positional relationship of the nitrogen to residue. I'm not aware of data on this, but I would, I've tried to sort of, you know, philosophize about how this would work, but in no-till, you would have less of a problem, but it would not be zero. And why is that? You're keeping most of the residue above the soil surface, but you still have kind of a root ball to deal with and everything that might tie up some nitrogen. So where that is in, in relation uh, to, to planting time and everything else is, is going to be an interesting thing for mobilization. So where's the residue and where's the nitrogen? If we're paying that penalty and you've got residue that's stirred into the upper part of the soil, knifing anhydrous, for instance, may not get the job done because the nitrogen's down here, the residue's up here, and you won't be overcoming that particular immobilization issue. So what, this is kind of a small slide for the back of the room. Let me just summarize it by saying the amount of residue is proportional to the amount of yield that you have. So we look at a harvest index, you got big yields, you got a lot of residue. And we'd go through that and try to account for that. And in the worst situation, you could, you know, 250 bushel yield, you might need 100 pounds of surface end to deal with that and chew up that nitrogen. Here's a graph that I would not use for, a, for any group, but what, again, the intellectuals we have here, um, we can go into this deeper stuff, right? We go, go in a deep dive here. And here's the point I want to make with this. This is kind of a busy slide, but let's not worry about all the specific numbers and just say that we have a 1x and 2x amount of wheat residue that we are turning into the soil and we are measuring the amount of nitrogen that is free in the soil over a period of time, right? So in the, in the lower case here where you've got uh, the, the, uh, the rectangles, you basically, within 15 to 18 days have tied up all the nitrogen that's in that soil and kept it tied up until about day 70, and then you really don't have much to brag about clear up to day 100. So basically, if you plant into that with all that residue and don't account for the nitrogen tie up, you're gonna be without nitrogen for 100 days, okay? So eventually, that will release again, but depending on the carbon nitrogen ratio, you have to make different uh, different decisions on how much nitrogen you put in the soil with that. Okay, another problem, changing gears quickly, is leaching. Leaching scenarios are going to be tied to a couple of key things when you're looking at scenarios, particularly for a testing thing. Where would leaching be the most, of most concern? Two things. One, in sandy soils, particularly if you have irrigation. So you may irrigate, and then you have a three-inch rain come along later and, and take that stuff down through the soil profile. You also, if you can keep the nitrogen out of the nitrate form and keep it in ammonium, you're also going to be able to, um, to you know, counteract any kind of leaching. So, and this will be an interesting year, um, I would say that we had probably a fairly open winter so far, and depending on when anhydrous went out, some of that may have nitrified. I don't know, but I, I think there's a chance of that What's that? Oh, feedback. All right. Okay, everybody's set on that. Let's go ahead and uh, we'll do a couple more of these and, and then uh, take a short break after about 10, 15 minutes. Denitrification is another bad nitrogen reaction. You take a look at this continuum of going from nitrate to uh, diatomic nitrogen across here, okay? You need to have specific conditions. So, you might get a scenario whereby you, you have some information on weather and climate since a nitrogen application, and if it's warm and moist, regardless of what source you put in the soil, you may have nitrate present at that time. You need three things to coexist in order to have denitrification. It, the nitrogen has to be in the nitrate form to start with, okay? You have to have warm conditions and you have to have saturation or near saturation. And what is the reason for all these? 
Number one, denitrification, again, only occurs to that particular, starts with that nitrate molecule. The warm, what does that suggest to you? If you need warm conditions, what does that suggest to you about the process? Microbes, right? Bacteria. And the saturation, what's, what's the deal there? Exclusion of oxygen into the soil. To try this experiment at home, to, to get through the point that oxygen is not diffused through water. Go to the bottom of your pool and lay there, and then you'll remember that you don't have gills, and you'll head back up to the surface, okay? So here's another one. I'll do some more uh, uh, bacteria theater. Um, this is kind of one of my little sideshows. A lot of times I'll have a, I've got a little uh, pony and a little cart and a couple dogs, and I travel around the countryside to county fairs doing, doing bacteria theater. <laughs> it's pr pretty well received. Okay. So... There's a special group of bacteria in the soil called facultative. They're very flexible. They can do a lot of different things depending on the conditions that they have. And these, most of the processes when we have oxygen are what we call aerobic. They require oxygen. So carbon breakdown, you know, all the respiration, all that stuff is all needs oxygen. What happens is if you get rain coming in over soil and you cut off the diffusion of oxygen in from the atmosphere, you tend to run out of oxygen in the soil, right? Why? Because there's a lot of aerobic organisms down there. When they shut the, the top off and they're trapped there, like breathing, but the oxygen supply is getting less and less. Meanwhile, the facultative bacteria transform and start pulling oxygen off of these different molecules, okay? Do you see this? Look at this. Here you've got three oxygens on the left, then two, then one, then half, then zero. So they are taking these oxygens as we go along and using them for their own bodies, okay? So facultative, here we go, facultative bacteria in the soil, oxygen, there's plenty of oxygen around. That's rain, that's thunder and rain, pitter patter, wet, okay? Sealed off. I notice a nitrate nearby. Get the oxygen from that. See how that goes? It's a continuum. And as you look across, eventually those last three are gases, okay? Another question. I asked you, we went through so well of uh, that first bacteria thing. How many of you have ever been to a dentist? About, about a quarter. Okay. If you're near... <laughs> Depending on your age, you may have... Uh, you know, taking a slug of whiskey or bitten on a Bowie knife and had your teeth pulled with no help at all. Then came a Novocaine generation, right? And anybody ever on, on nitrous oxide? Laughing gas. Okay, a couple of the younger ones, including maybe a fish concert. But that is actually one of the products that comes off here in the middle is nitrous oxide. So... If you're a little bit depressed about losing your nitrogen, if you get out in the field at the right time walking around, <laughs> it's all gone. It's gone. Fantastic. Uh, uh. So once those get to gases, they float away, and that's the end of it. So we lose a lot of nitrogen. And I know uh, Bob Hafe probably had you know, numerous phone calls every year after a rain, how much nitrogen have I lost? And that's always the million-dollar question about how to try to predict that or, or monitor that. Okay, ammonia volatilization is another one. Uh, ammonia and urea, uh, any, any source of ammonium even on the soil surface. If the pH is high, we have extra hydroxyls. Hydroxyls are going to take uh, one of those hydrogens off and make water, and then the other stuff's going to float off as ammonia gas, okay? Any of you that uh, old school that had the pleasure of uh, using a bucket loader to, to uh, clean out a chicken coop, understand the process of ammonia volatilization. Nitrification inhibitors, I told you would come back to those. They work on the nitrosomonas bacteria, that two-step equation that we looked at. We're worried about, we're gonna stop that first one uh, and from ever happening, and that's the one that's slower, and we're never gonna get into the nitrite and then the nitrate. Well, over time, 
the nitropyrin or, uh, you know, is going to eventually break down itself, but it is going to offer uh, a, a reduction in the speed of that particular transformation. Okay, here's urea volatilization from the surface. Uh, this is one that can happen again, and it's, it's exacerbated by high pH as well, but the urease enzyme puts both of those back into the surface. You know, a couple people have said this about the exam, very general stuff, but it, it does appear to be largely scenario-based. So you may, you know, you can start thinking about, and I'm, I'm gonna try to do this and help prepare you folks for test. I've not seen the exam, nor did I write it, but you start thinking about scenario-based planning and, and selections where you employ the knowledge that you have about the different, the different four R's and how that might take place. So let's say, for instance, I'm gonna pull this out of thin air, that you have a, uh, you know, you have 2,000 acres of corn ground and you have the ability to apply you know, 1,500 of those acres with anhydrous, and you've got these three types of soils. And you know, it turns out that you've got some, some irrigated sand. And so you might leave that out, and you've got other carriers you can use for that. So I think a lot of it from what I've been gathering is very situational, where you have to put several concepts together. Take credit for manure that goes out. Maybe you've got this many, uh, you know, this many head of, of cattle or, or this amount of uh, production of manure by hogs and you need to think about a, a really layered scenario where you come in and you have to realize what the value of that manure is the first year and even the second year and make appropriate fertilizer calculations. So it's not difficult to build conceptually what you might be seeing in this particular exam. Okay, we're going to go ahead and, and uh, start in with uh, placement here. Um, and then we've got a bunch of, uh, bunch of other nutrients and so forth to go through after nitrogen. When we think about placement, we want to think about where roots are growing and what sort of chemical reactions can occur in the soil. In particular, when we go through and talk specifically about phosphorus and potassium, there are certain soil conditions that are difficult to surmount, meaning that the, the individual uh, uh, availability of those elements is compromised by something that's happening in the soil. And one of the things that, that we can do, it's kind of like a, a herd of elk, this is completely random, a herd of elk in deep snow being attacked by wolves, what do they do? They band together. You can use this, by the way. They're, they band together, and therefore they're all concentrated and fewer bad things happen to them. So, for instance, we'll learn that in some difficult soil conditions, uh, banding potassium or phosphorus may be a, a way to get around that because it's not all tied up in the soil particles. And we need to look at what kind of tillage system that we're, we've got going on. Uh, we need to think, when we're thinking about no-till, we need to think about stratification. Another scenario thing that I would write if I were writing the exam is you've got a, uh, you've got a, a crop rotation that is going to have uh, tillage before corn and no-till soybeans into corn residue. And you've got a pH issue that you're trying to deal with and you're using, you know, you're using tillage, uh, you know, ahead of the corn. Well, that would be the obvious spot to make an entry point and mix in that lime, for instance. Also, placement, spatial variability in the field as we begin to take, uh, you know, GPS, uh, georeference type soil samples, we can come in and do placement that's going to account for that. So here again, we're gonna talk about nitrogen, and really the source that you use is going to determine uh, the placement and methodology that you use to apply that. And also, the placement is going to include use, potentially, of some technology products, whether it be slow release, a urease enzyme inhibitor, or a nitrification inhibitor. So for instance, if you have uh, let's say you have uh, urea or a UAN solution, a UAN solution that is going to be knifed into the soil. What's the need of a urease inhibitor there compared to on the surface? It's much less to zero, okay? So there may be scenarios and situations like that that will allow you to demonstrate your grasp of knowledge on some of these uh, different topics. Uh, fertigation is a great technique. Here's a, an opportunity if we've got irrigation, we can come in on a timely basis and add that nitrogen as that corn continues to call for it. The nitrogen environmental risk analysis is going to be tied in with the type of soil that we have, the type of climate that we have, 
uh, and what the different, uh, the, the positioning of the groundwater and surface water in the area that we are working. So when we look at geographical scale on, on nitrogen, again, we're talking about eutrophication being a problem where the algae growth is stimulated and usually nitrogen or phosphorus is the limiting factor for that algae growth. So if they're both in abundant supply, we will get the eutrophication and uh, you know, the degradation of water bodies. Drinking water standards, I don't know if they have a specific uh, deal on that in, in, in this particular exam. It's more of a one-shot deal you might see in the CCA exam. But 10 parts per million of nitrogen as nitrate is the drinking water standard. And so if communities have a surface water impoundment that's over that, they have to find some other water to mix in uh, because of this uh, threat, albeit a small threat, of the blue baby syndrome. Okay, let's talk a little bit about phosphorus. Uh, we've kind of finished nitrogen. Remember, we're going to be thinking about the source, the timing of that source, the placement of that source, whether we need a nitrification inhibitor or a urease enzyme inhibitor, and how we might partition that nitrogen application throughout the year. Here's phosphorus. Phosphorus comes in as two different forms with a negative uh, two and negative one charge on them, different phosphate species. What's interesting about this to me is the phosphorus... Uh, chemistry is very different than other anions. So when we think about sulfate and nitrate and chloride, they have a negative charge and they float freely in the soil with water, right? Phosphorus is very different. Why is that? Phosphorus, think about bones and teeth. Phosphorus bonds very, very tightly and becomes very insoluble when it's in contact with calcium. And at the other end of the pH range, it does the same thing with aluminum. So we can have aluminum phosphates or, or iron phosphates. So it becomes very insoluble, and that's an issue when we're dealing with phosphorus. So right source, uh, again, all these same parameters are all the way through. I'll skip through this very rapidly. But when we're talking about the rate of phosphorus, we need to operate with our phosphorus soil tests, okay? Start taking a look at those. And typically, we have a soil test extraction methods. I think you may run into something where you have, to, uh, you have to select between a Bray and an Olson extraction method. The Bray is typically used on our soils that are uh, not alkaline and pH of seven and above, they start to switch over to the Olson extraction. So how many of you people have ever wondered, it maybe pulled your vehicle on, you're going down the interstate or on a country road, suddenly you think, I wonder how they ever invented soil tests. And you've pulled over. Has that ever happened to anybody? <laughs> I don't know why it's this ridiculous question. But anyway, um, you could make a soil test in theory. So a soil test is very interesting you know, it, conceptually in that you might think, well, if we go out there and we find out exactly how much of that stuff is there, we're good to go and we can figure everything out from there. When in reality, what a soil test is, and we'll, I'll reemphasize this in a different part of the talk, but what we really have is some, something we do with a liquid and shake it to where we get a difference, and then we can correlate the different soil test levels that we find with the response to fertilizer. So in theory, if you found out that Diet Pepsi uh, would take more potassium out of a soil that didn't respond to potassium fertilizer, and it got less from a soil that didn't respond, you could have potentially a soil extraction method for soil test. Well, I'll show you a figure here that comes out of the University of Minnesota here shortly that shows like the different approaches they use for all soil tests. But anyway, we use two different ones for phosphorus and we're looking at uh, issues here of availability and we want to ensure that we don't get any kind of environmental problems, okay? This is a little busy, but here's uh, soil tests. If you've got a combination of manure and phosphorus fertilizer, you may want to use, if you're in a deficient range where you have a low soil test value and you've got a crop that's going to be pulling phosphorus off, you might need fertilizer and manure. You have manure you've got to put on the soil. You, you could be in that sweet spot up there where it's basically sufficient and you're meeting crop needs. And above that, you ought to be finding a different place to put that manure. So let's talk about detailed soil sampling. Here's another thing. If you read the, uh, the I think what's the last agronomy uh, handbook, 
There's a very interesting figure in there, and uh, if Bob's here, I don't know exactly who put this together, but it's, it's, it's mind-boggling in terms of reliability of soil tests, okay? So you look, and what's the most reliable soil test that there is? Anybody know? pH, pH soil, soil measured pH. Potassium's okay, phosphorus. And after that, it really starts to burrow down. And it's, it's very interesting that on some of these, we get in a situation where a tissue test, a observation of the soil properties or observation of visual deficiencies is probably about as good as some of the soil tests. So it's very interesting to look at how this continuum uh, switches. So we've got a, uh, a number of things out there that we do. So the basics of soil testing is you take a sample that you hope is representative of some area and you shake it with one of the following deals and you see again the Bray and Olson uh, uh, deal there, and I'll, I'll give a little tribute to Roger Bray here shortly. But you go through these different things, and then you do some kind of extract. You filter and analyze it. You get the parts per million in the soil, and then if you, you can take that uh, by an acre furrow slice, weighs two million pounds, so you multiply the part per million times two and get the pounds per acre. I don't know if that's a figure you want to remember for the exam, but that may be, in fact, part of it, changing part per million to pounds per acre. And here, I'd like you to memorize this. Uh, no, it's interesting, you can, you can Google this and find it online, but it shows all the different tests that are done that you do in a soil test and different types of extractants that you use to come up with these particular values. Here's the original work by uh, Roger Bray and, uh, and Toby Kurtz, and I never met Bray, but Kurtz was alive until uh, a few years ago, but this is 1945 science coming out of the University of Illinois. So here's the real concept of a relationship between a soil test and a response to fertilization. And what it means is simply this. If you have a very low soil test, you have a very high probability of crop response by adding fertilizer of that particular element. If you have a very high level in the soil, you have a very low probability of a response to that fertilization. And that's really what we're working with here. It just simply is a probability, not an absolute, that we can go out and make sure we're sufficient. And this is a, a figure I like to use in class quite a bit when I'm out uh, doing teaching and training, but again, this is the kind of the range of what we're looking at and the different approaches that we take to fertilization. Now this would be a great piece of looking at a scenario and trying to discuss what sorts of fertilization type approaches you would want to do. So we have a critical level, and below that level, we are saying that, you know what, we're potentially in a situation here where if we have a, a better than average year, we may not have enough of said nutrient to make that particular yield, that may be a limiting factor. So you might want to consider down in that area to actually build up the soil a little bit. Then we have the maintenance soil test, which is in between the critical level and the maintenance limit. And then above that, we may want to draw down the soil test, so we may not need, need any fertilizer at all. So conceptually, those are the different spots on a soil test, okay? So when you look at that and then try to devise a fertilization plan, you, to do the buildup, you would need uh, to, to make, uh, you know, four pounds of K2O equivalent for one part per million K, and nine for phosphorus. Here's a phosphorus rate, what we're considering here, the weather and climate, um, soil characteristics including leaching, although again, leaching is not as big a problem for phosphorus. The big one on phosphorus is to make sure we don't come out with the fertilization of phosphorus or manure when we have a situation where we've got imminent rainfall. There's ways to, we've got better and better tools to look at that now than we did uh, many years ago. So calculate the phosphorus credits. So this is another thing. Any fertilization problem that you have, if you just give somebody a field and you don't, and there's no history of anything, it's fairly straightforward, you might say, hey, we're gonna need 150 pounds of N. Here are the potential fertilizer carriers. We can talk about how to make that calculation. We kind of did it verbally here, uh, you know, half an hour ago or so. But if you, in fact, are, have a situation with credits, it makes it a much more interesting and challenging problem. So right from the get-go, anytime you, and you may have story problems, these are word problems, which 
automatically. How many people, just the term word problem, sends a chill, a cold chill down their spine of remembering school at all? So, you know, now you've got, oh my gosh, it's not just the math. I've got to piece together and figure out what all these numbers mean, some of which may have no influence at all on solving the problem. That's the classic situation. You know, you write along, okay, uh, uh, Jim and Jan have a farm, and they uh, applied this much manure last year, and the price of sugar is currently 75 cents a pound. If it takes 20 gallons of gas to drive from their place to Chicago, and their carrier is uh, anhydrous ammonia, and you're like, oh my God, what's going on here? It's like, why in the world do I have to remember how much it takes to drive to Chicago? And in fact is you don't. So that's what I'm saying. You go into these problems and you look at it, and the first thing you look for are credits. So one of the classic ones uh, that, that I like to throw out in class is, you give the students some DAP, and you make them meet the phosphorus needs with that, okay? But then, you gotta remember, there's some nitrogen in DAP, and that can go as a credit for the nitrogen the next year. Previous phosphorus applications, manure, biosolids, and wastewater. These all have phosphorus in them. I heard, and this is a scary thing, one of the people who took the test said that you're supposed to remember, because it's not given to you, the percentage availability of manures through time and also legumes. So that's something to, to think about. Ad adjustments uh, due to legacy phosphorus. If we have soils that have been manured for decades, we may have a high enough phosphorus where we don't need to worry too much about that. Okay. Here's another thing in, in Illinois, and this is straight out of the uh, agronomy handbook. We take into account the soil test from the subsoil, and this is typically done by region. So in other words, there are regions where there's naturally a higher phosphorus content in, in, the, uh, uh, in, the, in, in those particular regions, and we adjust that phosphorus application in that way. Okay, so timing. The big one on phosphorus. Now, phosphorus, again, we're finding more phosphorus leaching through the soil than we previously thought in some cases. But still, by and large, the greatest loss of phosphorus off of a farm field would be moving over the surface of the soil. So in other words, the phosphorus, if it's surface applied, is going to hang on to soil particles. So if you get erosion, that's how you're going to lose phosphorus out of that particular field. But also, if you come in and make a surface application and get a heavy rain, the actual dissolved phosphorus in that field may run off and get quickly out of the field. So we really want to be careful ahead of any kind of major precipitation event. The mechanisms of uh, phosphorus loss to surface water, these are all, again, some of the performance objectives. Strategies to reduce it, well, if you're going to reduce particulate phosphorus, you're basically just asking to control erosion. You don't want any surface erosion taking that enriched upper soil that has all the phosphorus in it away into the water. And Keep in mind, we can get it into, uh, in, into surface waters by a tile drainage and so forth. But application timing, again, is primarily considered with uh, meshing with rainfall, heavy rainfall. So, and tillage practice. Obviously, if you stir in DAP into the soil, you're not going to get, uh, you're unlikely to get as much phosphorus moving off that field because the phosphorus will go in and bind with the individual soil particles. So here's a look of kind of the scenario of phosphorus in a winter landscape, and there's a big no-no. I used to call, this is dated information uh, in terms of culturally dated. Do they still sell something called the banjo minnow? I, I used to really love to watch uh, infomercials about fishing lures. That, I mean, they're no match for Ronco with the set it and forget it. That's an all-time classic. Or the pocket fisherman. But the banjo minnow was, was absolutely irresistible to bass. It had like it looked like it had already been half eaten, it would flop around in the water. So I always refer to questions as a banjo minnow question, meaning that the unaware student is going to get gut hooked on this particular question. And so any kind of surface application of manure or fertilizer, again on frozen soil, on snow, or when the top two inches is saturated is totally for Bowdoin and for, for this exam, okay, and in real life as well. So that's something to remember. 
Placement and runoff risk, uh, things you can do, again, it's all pretty much in, the, in, the, in this controlling movement off the surface water. And we've looked at this kind of stuff with nitrogen as well. Put it in the soil, keep it off the surface, keep manure in, and we'll be in, in good shape. Okay, so that's the general idea on phosphorus. What are the take-home messages on phosphorus? Keep it off the surface, take account for it in manure, take account for it in DAP, and when you have to fertilize for phosphorus and use DAP or MAP, make sure you take credit for the nitrogen fertilizer that comes with that. Okay, let's go back, back up a little bit and lay down some basics here before we talk about uh, potassium. And this, in fact, also goes for many of the other elements that exist in a cationic state. <laughs> that sounds almost like a sleep. That's, uh, anyway, a cation, they're positively charged. So the soil has negative charges in it that are natural, and they come from, they, they emanate from organic matter and clay. So the more organic matter we have, the more clay we have, the higher the cation exchange capacity, which also means the more of these goodies we can hold on the soil. The opposite of this would be a sand soil with low organic matter, where we don't have much of the storage uh, capacity. Um, I actually was a soil science major as an undergraduate. <laughs> it's a high, uh, huge demand for that major, I, <laughs> as you might imagine. I moved into my dorm and I thought, why am I the only person in this dorm that's not pre-med? And I was pre-soils. I mean, I was really pumped up about this. <laughs> but as it turned out, um, the course path that I took, the stuff that I was interested in, worked out a lot better than a lot of the pre-med students. After the first semester, if they got a C in comparative anatomy, they were then pre-dent. <laughs> and then come up, they got a B hung on in physics, they're they pre-optician. And then eventually real estate. So it went. <laughs> so anyway, I thought, I thought, man, we're gonna have a bunch of doctors. <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> Just a few. Okay. So my point is, I'm in, I'm, I mean, I'm like saying, hey, guess what, you know? You're hating on me because I'm soils. You know, we, I take chemistry. In fact, I've seen you in there. I'm riding, riding back to my, uh, I lived in an apartment, and I'm on this, this bus, and I'm sitting there just looking out the window, and I hear a guy behind me go, boy, I'll tell you what, I'm getting torn up in that soils class. And I'm like, oh, interesting, because I'm, I'm in there. And he starts talking about, you know, it was going pretty good there for a while. He said, then they started talking about them Cations. Cations. <laughs> oh, I didn't have the heart to turn around and go, hey, by the way, dude, it's cation. But that's one of the pronunciation problems within the soils business. The other thing I tell people that are going out into the, uh, into the private world of ag and, and moving on to farmer's fields and trying to converse intelligently is always pronounce individually the two letters in PH. Because if you go onto a farmer's field and say you're concerned about their soil, <laughs> It's a, it's a real credibility kill. <laughs> you got that loaf going on over here. So here are all the cations, they kind of hang out, and since it says exchange capacity, they're held with various degrees of tightness. The plant takes something out of solution, ammonium, potassium, one has the tendency to pop off and continue that supply. So this is an important sort of building block when we begin to talk about potassium. So here, the, you know, the stuff pops off into solution. There's some equilibrium that's set up, and that's where our nutrition comes for a lot of those particular uh, cations. And you know, here's a heavy clay, 50, but the common range, kind of 5 to 25. 25 would be a pretty good soil uh, in Illinois. And 5, you know, you're getting down. You get even 3 or whatever in some of the real blow sand. But they're better able to hold nutrients. So what, why does this matter? Well, when we start talking about potassium fertilization, on the the garden variety of soils, we don't have too many issues, but if we get onto a, a real sand with low CEC, we might want to think about moving application closer to the time of plant uptake because our storage capability is a little bit lower. I know this probably brings tears to your eyes, noting, and some of you, this is subliminal, but did you notice that each section is color coded? Isn't that something? Now, do you know how many weeks it took me to try to approximate the range of color in uh, potassium chloride? <laughs> All right. Yeah. 
I can tell, you know, there's two or three people up front that are impressed with almost everything I say, and, and God bless both of you. That's right. All right. Not related, by the way, not related. Okay. So same thing with potassium we're looking at. How do, we, how do the four R's fit into some of these different things? And again, nitrogen and phosphorus. If you're writing an exam on this stuff, or you're trying to be a better citizen of the world, or you're worried about stewardship, that's where the main focus is going to be in terms of the interaction of crop growth and environmental. So what we're talking about here is looking at some different things on potassium. Uh, potassium, you've got a soil test level. This is, a, you won't mention any names here, but there, this is a, a much discussed topic within the state of Illinois and different approaches to uh, potassium fertilization and nutrition. Is that, was that fairly well stated for, yeah, okay. Um, but we get a crop response to potassium the, one of the real big things of interest is soil moisture and sampling on the soil test. And the late uh, Dr. Ted Peck used to work on this quite a bit of the fact, and I'll show you a, a little uh, diagram in a second, but potassium can be trapped within clay layers, okay? So some of the clay uh, mineralogy that we have can actually work to trap that internally. What we look for in, in potassium uh, fertilization is to look at the exchange capacity of the particular soils and adjust it in that way. But you see that the constant theme on soil test versus response is soil buildup plus maintenance, maintenance alone, and none of the above, and the three different regions that are signified in that, in that particular graph. And again, we can, get some, uh, we can get some boost out of some of these other things that we added like everything else. What about the timing of potassium? Curiously, this is a, and, and this is not a huge issue, but on lighter colored, lighter soils with some crops that are highly sensitive to chloride and salt index, I mentioned before tobacco and tomato, you may want to consider uh, putting that, when you put that out of planting, you got to consider what the salt index might be. And the soil sampling, this is straight out of the agronomy handbook, because there's a variation in how much available phosphor or potassium shows up in a soil test, based on the wetting and drying history of that particular soil. So and you can tell, this, this to me is almost unnerving. This is kind of a correction factor because of what happens in the wild swings in potassium you can get depending on how that particular uh, sample was treated. And this is kind of what happens, and I, I took this off of, uh, of a, a PowerPoint presentation on the web, it's done out of Wisconsin here, but it shows you these clay layers uh, we have two to one expanding and some of the more mica-like type clays. What happens is water gets in and they swell and these interlayers open up and potassium and ammonium both fit in there. It's even more of a problem for potassium. And then as that soil dries, that potassium is, cl is clamped in there and it's not available. So if you look at the potassium on the outside of that particular mineral, that actually can come in a solution, but the other one is trapped until it ne uh, next time it wets up. Okay, so where do we place this stuff? Again, CEC level is important. If we have uh, high potassium fixing soils, we may want to consider banding. Okay, we'll go ahead and get into uh, secondary nutrients and liming. So again, these, we've, we've talked about uh, N, P, and K. We're going to talk now about these three secondaries. Sulfur is kind of hanging out there by itself, but calcium and magnesium are really wrapped around what we're talking about when we talk about soil pH. Rate, timing, and placement, same, same stuff. These are all the, the learning performance objectives. And then also when we talk about micronutrients, um, zinc, manganese, and boron are the main ones that you're asked to consider. And, uh, and those have different reactions when it comes to pH and so forth. Okay, so all but boron are more available at low pH. This is one thing you're going to uh, want to remember. When we Let's blurt out, what, what pH would you like to have your soil at if you could choose a number for corn or soybean production? 6.2, six, six, eight, six, five, six, okay, all in the, kind of in the sweet spot where um, we have a pH, where basically, this is the way I like to explain it is, we pick a pH where we have enough micronutrient most of the time and phosphorus is available. A lot of the, uh, the uh, nitrogen and, and potassium are somewhat flat across, across that particular pH range, so they're fine. But one of the things on micronutrients, you know, if we have conditions that are going to render 
a micronutrient unavailable, we may want to consider a foliar application because it's too difficult to change the soil environment. So here's another thing, and this is, this is just my philosophy, but I think this is somewhat true. If you have a low pH, you're typically in a humid environment, and you can add lime and correct that problem. If you have a high pH, it's probably because you're in an arid environment, and it's more difficult to change that problem because you don't have water. So you deal with the high pH, and you manage for the, uh, you, you go ahead and try to correct the low pH. So are we going to see more or less micronutrient uh, deficiencies in the future? Well, I would say, you know, if we're continuing to pile up monster yields based on Liebig's uh, the law of the minimum at some point, maybe some of these will pop up. And in fact, I know that some of you get responses to some of these particular uh, elements. So here's the thing uh, often seen. You can see, you Google uh, uh, nutrient availability and pH. There's about 500 of these that come up on, on the internet. But as you can see here, iron, manganese, Copper, zinc, molybdenum all get squeezed out a little bit as we get up into the higher pHs. Boron's got kind of a double, uh, a, a double move there where it actually uh, you know, gets more at very high pH. But you can see that magnesium, calcium, calcium and so forth are less available at lower pH. And phosphorus has a, an interesting response in that it also has a thick band around the medium pHs. It's fixed by aluminum and iron at low pH and calcium at higher pHs. So again, typically 6.5. What are some examples of a horticultural crop that does better at a lower pH? I'll give you a couple hints. Pancakes. Blueberries, right, very good. So yeah, that's, and, and the reason is, and along with that whole family, azaleas, rhododendrons, they have an enormous iron requirement, and iron it gets pinched out at those lower pHs. So or at the higher pHs when it uh, binds up with carbonate. Okay, so what are we dealing with in low pH? And boy, down in the south, uh, you know, years ago when I went to, uh, I got my PhD at NC State, and uh, a lot of the orange soils, you know, low natural pHs, and farmers thinking like, why in the world would I want to put lime on there? That doesn't, you know, would put on NP, whatever. Enormous response, especially with soybeans, of lime, which was not that expensive. And you started to eliminate some of these problems that can show up with a low pH. Aluminum, manganese, toxicities, there's just, it's too available. Aluminum is not an essential element, but it's very dangerous. It, it crumples up roots and makes roots stubby and so forth. You get slow mineralization, slow symbiotic nitrogen, and low phosphorus. That's the low pH. High pH, you can get iron deficiencies in particular. Uh, Western Minnesota, Nebraska, this is a, a very large issue. They've got free calcium carbonate in the soils that keeps the pH high. We have a high pH soil in uh, Illinois that's naturally out there, where we, have, uh, we had glaciers and an end of a moraine, and you had a little glacial pond down at the bottom of that. Water melted through hundreds or thousands of years, or a lot of snails, and now the snail shells actually act as a liming agent and keep those uh, pH levels high there. So you run into manganese and zinc deficiency, and you can also have problems with, with phosphorus as well. Okay, now we're moving to another topic and to talk briefly about lime and some of the reactions that occur there. Lime is white, right? You've, you know, you've picked up, that's really something. <laughs> if anybody needs a tissue to dab away a tear, we could probably get you one. Looks like everybody's all right. Okay. Lime, same thing, rate, timing, and placement. Soil test and buffer pH, I'll talk a little bit about that and what that means. Magnesium, need of or not, uh, as we look at calcium-magnesium balances. And look at the source of lime and the nutrients supplied by lime. So lime is basically going to bring in calcium and magnesium, or, or sometimes calcium alone. And it's typically what it does is it allows the availability of these other nutrients to be more prominent. So that's a really important thing, okay? Soil pH and buffer pH. Anybody know about that? That's how lime requirements are determined. So the regular soil pH we talk about, you take distilled water, stir the soil, you stick a pH probe in there which measures the amount of hydrogen that's there, okay? That's the amount that naturally comes into solution. A buffer pH is a solution that you pour in that is going to eat up some of that 
uh, activity and you measure a second pH. If that pH changes dramatically compared to the water pH, elevates, let's say, that means that the soil is poorly buffered, which means that you can change it with very little lime. If the pH remains the same, then you need more lime. So what this does, it measures the amount of reserve acidity that's there, okay? Here's another, let me think of another example. Let's say that you decide that you are going to uh, be good. I, I love using chicken wings for almost every analogy. Let's see if I can do this here. <laughs> Let's say you got, no, I won't go to the chicken wing thing. Anyway, point is you have a lot of hydrogen left on cation exchange sites in a soil that's, that's well buffered. You have to put lime in and move all of that hydrogen off those sites and neutralize it before you effectively change the pH in the soil. On a sand, if you have a pH of six, you require much less lime than a silty clay loam with high organic matter with a pH of six because more of the sites in that, in that uh, silty clay loam have got hydrogen on them. So agricultural lime, again, long-term weathering is, a, is gonna be a, a, a way that we have uh, lowered pH, so these Ancient soils in the southeastern United States are naturally have a lower pH, and the ones that are in that are arid conditions with free calcium carbonate have higher pH. The breakdown of organic matter and the oxidation of fertilizers containing ammonium. So again, when we use anhydrous ammonia, and it grabs a water molecule and then goes to nitrate, those three hydrogens are actually released uh, into the water. These are the different soil acidifying processes. So what ag lime does is it, it increases the pH of the soil. It may help soil structure, as would gypsum, because the calcium is a binder that helps soils to flocculate instead of disperse. So a calcium can act as like a connector between a couple soil particles. And again, we're going to optimize, the, uh, optimize that uh, uptake of other nutrients. Continuous small acidifying rate of the Midwestern Corn Belts is going to require lime applications in most scenarios every two to four years, and the Western Corn Belt is a higher pH area. Okay, I don't know how many of you have ever seen a limestone deposit, but these are, uh, you know, they're around, they're scattered around, ancient deposits. We look at uh, phosphorus and potassium, it's the same, same way. Uh, you look, there's a little bitty truck down there, um, over near... Uh, was it near Gary, Indiana, along that interstate? You can look off and see this huge, huge uh, quarry for that particular material taken and ground up. Let's talk a little bit about the liming reaction and what actually occurs, because the liming reaction requires a couple different things going on. One, one thing is you're trying to reduce the amount of acidity. You're trying to neutralize hydrogen. But you're also trying to push that hydrogen into solution that's on the cation exchange sites, okay? Is there anyone in this group that's ever had heartburn? No, one person, okay, well, we'll use you as an example. <laughs> so no one's ever eaten food that, okay, well, I'll take your word for it. Um, again, I wanna address the people that have a little bit of age on them before, uh, before stuff like these new acid blockers were, were formulated or whatever. What did people do years and years ago, back in the old days, to get rid of a acid indigestion? What's that? Baking soda. Baking soda, right, right, okay. And when you took it, I'm guessing, you know, you get water, you put a little baking soda in it, stir it up and drink it, right? And then how was relief signified when a reaction had occurred? How, what would happen? A belch, very good. Do you know what that gas was? Be careful. Carbon dioxide. That's what that is, okay? It's the exact same reaction that's happening uh, in the soil. In that, you're grabbing something off, in the case of the bicarbonate, you're grabbing that, that carbonate there, the first one, and you're, you're reacting that with hydrogen to form water and carbon dioxide. The hydroxyl, which can be part of a lime as well, would grab a single hydrogen and make water. And the last one, the uh, oxide, would grab two hydrogens and make water. So you're pushing the calcium and magnesium, push the hydrogen into solution. The anion comes in and changes it to carbon dioxide or water, okay? 
Yeah, for some of you trying to uh, cut costs, if you're at an ag retail facility and you don't have the money to buy some Tums or anything and you've got a pile of lime around, just wet your lips, fall face forward, that's about the right dose rate. Come back up. <laughs> no, actually, this, I think I'm going to start a fun right now. If Mel Fiesel has, has started a fund that can go to people that are too poor to buy ad assets, okay? And we'll try to get a little collection plate going around on that. Okay, so what makes a lime? It has to have calcium or magnesium or both. You can have a calcium magnesium carbonate and it must contain one of the following anions, carbonate, hydroxyl, or oxide, okay? Everybody got that? Which of the following is a lime? <laughs> yeah, let's start with the ones on the right. Um, that looks like a lemon, and then a lime, okay. But look at this list over here. Remember, we have two rules, both of conditions which need to be met. Does the first one have a calcium or magnesium? Yes, does it have a carbonate, a hydroxyl, or an oxide? Yes. So, first one, yes. Second one, third one, no. Can't have sodium, gotta have calcium or magnesium. Fourth one, fifth one, no, because it's got iron instead of uh, calcium or magnesium, okay? So there's a specific number, it's basically calcium or magnesium or both of them together with one of those anions. Those are what actually pass as a lime. So how much? Again, we compare the water and buffer pH levels and the more organic matter in clay, the more lime it takes to affect a pH change from X to X plus 0.1 or so. And it's because of the CEC and reserve acidity that makes that a problem. So we lime acid soils and we manage high pH soils. It's very difficult to lower pH and we get in, I don't believe you're going to have any uh, saline sodic soil stuff. I didn't see any of that on the performance objectives. It's something they deal with in the western United States. And really uh, I've got a, a friend who's the uh, guy I went to grad school with who's a head of a state department of ag that does soil testing. They deal with a lot of sandy soils. One of the biggest problems they run into is over liming. So let's say you get a soil test report back and you're on a sand and it says, uh, you know, half a ton. You think, well, good grief, that, and I'm going to be back there in three years doing the same thing. I'll just put a ton out right now. Well, that's a problem. You can jack the pH up and there could be uh, issues there. I know the people that crop scout sometimes remark they get called out to look at a small area of a field that's got some really bizarre looking plants in it, whether be a reaction to herbicide or some kind of nutrient deficiency. And oftentimes these are on the downwind side of a gravel road. And what happens is some of our producers are so expert at scouting now that they can do this at 70 miles an hour in a vehicle going down a gravel road. And that dust ends up as a liming agent and can really, uh, really change the reaction of those particular plants. Okay, moving on. Any questions on lime or lime reaction? Manure, I swear, I, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm, I'm trying to channel the people that write, write these exams, and it, everything about manure fits into this exam. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just said, that, not related to anything about writing exam, but here's the deal. What's so beautiful about Invoking manure into an agricultural setting to get people to think. Look at all the calculations you have to do. <laughs> it's perfect. It's like a math torture chamber. So you're going to start off with how many animals do you have? And what is the output of those animals on an annual basis? And what is the analysis of that manure? And what's the, what's the, uh, the take on that manure the second year? or maybe even the third year. And you've got N, P, and K. You, got, you start off with like, holy smokes. And manure, you've got to put it somewhere. So you're going to apply it on fields. You may have questions about whether to cut it into the soil, what soil it needs to be on within a farm. All of these questions are, would be fair game. So I would, I would be shocked if you don't see any manure uh, problems. And you, again, you have to take account of the nutrient uh, content that's in that manure. 
So you got a whole herd or flock and uh, annual output of this stuff. You got N, P, and K, maybe some of the other material that mostly work with N, P, and K. And the total number of animals in the unit, um, and there's a ag waste field book that NRCS puts out, and uh, you can find a link in the objectives that have been handed out or go online to find those objectives. But look at the necessity of uh, manure analysis over table. That's always preferred to analyze the manure and see what's happening there, and then calculate the amount of N, P, and K amount. So you've got to keep record keeping to look at the annual uh, application rate you're doing on your fields. And you know, years ago, I'm, uh, this didn't happen always, but my guess is if you're an operator and you've got manure and you've got a field that's trafficable near, your, near where the manure is, go out and spread it and you're done. And, uh, and now, you know, we've got to think more creatively about the cost, where to take it, what the soil tests are, and where that goes. So you've got to, uh, you've got to take a look to it where application can take place. There are some setbacks from bodies of water that need to be taken into account. And you've got to look at the amount of acreage you have and the annual output and figure out what to do with that manure. So you just can't keep uh, applying it to one, one place. You're looking at soil tests, acreage, and annual output from your operation. Okay. All right. We're going to keep moving along here. Um, any questions on manure? I heard from someone who took the exam that you, you need to know numbers of how much is available the first and second year of some of these nutrients. So, uh, and that's, I don't have them at my fingertips, but that's going to be in some of the resource uh, material that you do have. Okay. All right. Here are some possible scenarios. Again, these are taken out of this, uh, this manual that, uh, again, I find quite useful. And as I put together uh, the webinar with scenarios and key points that test takers need to remember, um, I, will, I will look at some of these again and try to give you some, some problems to work with. I'll also have a couple words right at the end here about what, um, what are some ways to uh, de de-freak out, whatever that term would be, about doing calculations. Like what are some things we need to be thinking about to try to push through that particular part of, of this exam. So here's another like typical sort of scenario that you might get. Um, and looking at the uh, economically optimal nitrogen rate and interpreting a graph like that. This would be fair game. So you're going to have to look at graphs and figure out potentially what they're asking or what kind of decisions you would make uh, with this particular graph. So this is an interesting one in that, I was discussing this with some people during the break, I think a lot of times in, in yesteryear, People tend to put more nitrogen on the better soil, figuring we've got a bigger crop and so forth. When in fact, in some cases, the lower organic matter soil is going to have more response to higher fertilizer than would the higher organic matter soil. So one thing to look at here in answering a potential question. Here's another thing you, you could get. You might have a, a scenario like this. You might have some no-till. You might have a, a field that uh, you still, you're doing row cultivation, who knows? But think about your different nitrogen carriers and where they fit in terms of the broad expanse of the farm. I think I've heard from a couple folks that you, you will be given a, you might be giving, given a farm with like four different cultural conditions. You might have a, you know, fully cultivated, uh, full tillage system with corn you might have corn on corn over here, you might have irrigated sand here, and you've got to think creatively about how to deploy your resources and what kind of management approaches you might take on those different soils. So again, with your, with your sources of nitrogen, think about each specific one and what sort of uh, important properties they have you need to be thinking about. So in a case like this, what would come to mind? What high residue, uh, you know, on the surface, and you've got no-till corn, and you want to put on nitrogen. What, what, what are your options? UAN, okay, and then, you, and then the next question would be knife dribbled. If, if dribbled on, on high residue, you may want to have a urease enzyme inhibitor with it. Those are the kind of sort of involved management type decisions you might have to make based on scenario type thinking. 
This one, again, a banjo minnow, you gotta stay off of this. There's no reason to go out there. You can't put manure, you can't put fertilizer, particularly uh, phosphorus, and this is, is gonna be an issue there. Okay, all right. All, a lot of this stuff comes with weather. This is only partially related, but I've been, I'm in sort of the middle of all of this stuff that's happening in real time. Um, there's a, some of you heard of climate, you've heard of Encirca, you've heard about this uh, program out of Cornell. There's all kinds of stuff going on right now that people are learning to try to get weather, integrate big data, weather, and other things around. I'm familiar with this company, Agrable, that's a, it's a startup in Champaign, and uh, one, of, uh, one of my former grad students is here, and another grad student is from his hometown is, is instrumental in this, so I happen to know something about that. I've talked to them some. Some of you worked with climate. There's a lot of different things going on there to try to figure out what's happening weather-wise. Here's an example of output that's happening remotely for people that have a lot of different fields, uh, trying to basically using big data for weather and rainfall and then trying to calculate based on the kind of soil you have when that can be worked. And then you, know, you can see the next step on that, people looking at moisture content, looking at temperature, and then trying to figure out what's going on with nitrogen. We also have people working on spraying, spray smart, where looking at wind direction, uh, all, uh, you know, what are those called, uh, inversion layers, this, this sort of thing, which is gonna be interesting, we use growth regulator herbicide. Here's something, a free app if you're interested that I've, uh, this, this is actually kind of a cool story. A teenager wrote this. So there are, I have children, okay? So it's really cool to see a smart child. Um, and actually, yeah, I have a fair number of children. But anyway, uh, this kid who wrote this is 16. He wrote an algorithm to where you can download this app uh, for free and Wherever you're at, if you've got GPS locator, you can hit go and it'll tell you how much rain they had there in the last 24 hours. It's bizarre. Like, are you kidding me? So I went home and I took, I've got a 16 year old in the house and who knows the kid who wrote this. And I went home and, you know, I grabbed him by the lapels. I said, have you written any code today? <laughs> just, just kidding. Have you written any code? <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. But anyway, uh, I entertained myself. I, uh, I was forced to watch the Cubs this one time this year, and uh, uh, I went up on the train from Champaign, and it was after a huge rain, so I entertained myself every 10 miles looking at how much rainfall they had near and look out the window. But anyway, this is the kind of stuff that's now available, and this, you know, it'll be interesting to see how this stuff catches on, but it's quite interesting. Okay, a word on conversions. So again, those of you taking the test, you know, part of what might kind of get you agitated or whatever, is if someone says, hey, you need to convert kilograms per hectare into pounds per acre. And immediately you're like, what? What are you talking about? I don't, I don't care about kilograms per hectare. Well, what the deal is, and this is a, it's, it's a math, it's a math game, and we'll, we'll go over this quite a bit in the webinar, but it's all about Units canceling. So if you go through mechanically and you get the concept of how to, how to cancel units, for instance, in fertilizer, we have our analysis. Let's use nitrogen, straightforward, right? So anhydrous ammonia is 82% nitrogen, right? So if I tell you I got 100 pounds of that, you multiply by the percentage and you find out how many pounds of nitrogen. 82, right? If you want 100 pounds, then you've got to divide by 0.82 to, to get that. So there's different ways you, you have to work with the units and go through and cancel those. I'll show you a quick example. So this one right here, pounds per acre to kilograms per hectare. Now, I don't believe that you need to know the values. I don't think you need to go in there armed with, I hope I'm right on this, but it's my guess, you don't need to know every conversion factor, but you need to know how to use the conversion factors when given. So this is what you do. If you want to get a term out, so you're starting with pounds per acre, and we have to go to kilograms per, per hectare, it would be a two-step process. To get pounds out of the numerator, you've got to multiply it by some factor which has pounds in the denominator. 
being underneath, okay? I thought this was the sniper coming on the, okay. <laughs> yep. So that goes directly into kilograms per, hectare, per acre, okay? Then you come down here, and now we're trying to get the acres out. So it's in the denominator of the first one. You need to find a value for acres per hectare, and that's how you go through it. So the, the language is the part that hangs people up sometimes. It's the like quintails per fortnight or something. You're like, what the heck? But you go through and get the math on it and cancel units, and that's the best way to work through those. This is almost unbelievable. This, we're coming in for a landing. The, you know, the tray tables are up right at the right time. It's pretty exciting. Okay, the test, written from performance objectives. This is what we know about it, 50 multiple choice questions. However, we have it on good, a good source that claims that there may be multiple questions based on one read problem that's a scenario that may you know, multiply on down. Scenario thinking, use of charts, graphs, et cetera. And this conversion factor should be given to you. And they state this up front in the performance objectives of this exam, that they're trying to elevate the, the thinking level of this particular type of approach, and they rarely, if ever, use the word list. Like, if someone were to ask me, list the four greatest nitrogen scientists that you've ever known, okay? Be Haber, Bosch, Howard Brown, and Bob Haft in no particular order. <laughs> That's simple. I mean, everybody would make the same list. But if you're asked to construct, evaluate, estimate, demonstrate, analyze, these are different. So all of the performance objectives are wrapped around these particular terms. So you have to go beyond just writing the list down. Additional resources is the one I told you about here, various state and federal pubs. These are all uh, going to be important for you to look at and, and uh, looking at these 590 plans and so forth. And uh, yes, upcoming, here they are. And I think you know people here will get you in touch with how to do these. We'll be, uh, be live for an hour and a half to try to go over these different calculations and then a short review of the final objectives. So, I wish you all uh, good, good luck. It's nice to see everybody. Um, you're taking the exam, get pumped up, and uh, I'll be cheering for you. Good luck to all of you, nice to see everybody, and uh, good luck on the exam and whatever you're doing. Good to see you, thanks.